So there's this nation called Israel. They become enslaved in Egypt for about 400 years. They cried out to God and God heard them. And he raises a man called Moses. Moses leads them out of slavery into freedom. So they're led from a, a, a season of a long season of slavery to a season of freedom. Uh, but they were very rebellious people. And they were very stubborn. So God ended up allowing them to die in the wilderness. And he said, I'm not going to give the promise to you, but I will give it to your children because you guys are just complaining a lot and you're just really misbehaved. And then uh, they die. Moses dies. And a new leader rises up and his name, his name is Joshua. Joshua is the guy that leads this entire nation of Israel from wandering in the desert to actually conquering the promised land. And so they crossed over a river called the Jordan River. When they cross over... They were all like, yeah, we made it. Happy New Year's, everybody, right? We went from 22 to 2023. They were all happy and they were all excited. And it's a new season because now they're like, they're stepping closer into God's promise. Now they're closer to what God had promised them that, and, and, and they were excited about it. But then they cross over and they're crossing over into their blessed situation. And then as soon as they're done crossing over in chapter five um, or in chapter four, they enter chapter five and God's like, I want you to make knives. And, and, and I want you to circumcise all the men. And I can't imagine just like the celebration of crossing over and like, we're here and we made it. And then all of a sudden God goes, make knives. And in the Spanish Bible, when you read the Spanish Bible, it says, make them out of stone. Make knives out of stone. Can you imagine a knife out of stone? And there is no anesthetic. Okay, so you don't have a professional clean cut. It's going to be something rough tough the entire nation's 3.6 million people so at least 1.5 million of them are men can you imagine circumcising about 1.5 million men that is crazy and sometimes i think that we read the story and we read it and we're like oh they got circumcised How? okay next but can you imagine the stress of these men if you're a man you can if you're a woman, I'm not sure. But just think about the stress, about, just, just, just picture being in a lineup. Okay, you got five guys ahead of you and you're watching the circumcision happen. There is no anesthesia. You cannot numb the area. And you're watching guys scream before your turn. And then they can barely walk, it paralyzes them a little bit. Can you imagine the stressful situation these men must have gone through? So that's why I titled my sermon today for you. I'm so blessed, but I'm stressed. <laughs> I'm so blessed, I'm so stressed. <laughs> Let me define what blessed means according to the Urban Dictionary. It means an objective for feeling good or having something good happen to you. That's the truth, that when we feel blessed, it's because something good just happened to us. Your crush said yes to you. Someone complimented you on your weight loss. You um, got the promotion that you were looking for and praying for. You finally got the approval to get the car and you bought a really nice car. Well, you didn't buy it, you just got a huge debt. <laughs> and you post it on social media and there it is, hashtagged blessed. Something good happened to you. You're feeling blessed. Something good happened to you or you're feeling good. And then here's the definition of stressed. And stressed is experiencing physical, mental, or emotional strain or tension. Being stressed means that there's a stronger pressure on the outside that is trying to make you snap. That's, that's stress. It's where you feel like you can't handle it anymore. Uh, where Just imagine, I know Pastor Robert Morris uh, defined stress really well through an analogy, and he put... Uh, um, he put, um, I don't know if you know what casing is, like just a really thin strip of wood mm -hmm. and put it on two uh, 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 stands mm -hmm. on each side and he started putting weights in the middle of this flexible board uh, or, or piece of wood. Yeah. And the more weight, the more it started bending until the weight snapped it. Yeah. That's called stress. Yeah. Right. Stress wasn't really an emotional term. It was just more of a scientific term yeah. right. until people... Some dude saw a board get snapped and he's like, that looks like my life. <laughs> I'm so stressed. And so there are seasons where you can live in what seems like 
you can be living in a moment or in a season as if you are living in a contradiction. You're feeling blessed because there's a tension between being blessed yet feeling stressed. So for example, what do you do when God is blessing you but his blessings are so weighty that they overwhelm you? What happens when the blessing is so big that you feel like you can't carry it any longer? Or here's my favorite one, what do you do when what God has given you appears to be a blessing on the outside to onlookers, but in secret, it's a burden to you mentally and physically. There are those moments where we live in life where we've crossed over, we're no longer slaves, we're free, but circumcision's right around the corner. And you're blessed but you're stressed. You're blessed because you see God's goodness, but man, sometimes his goodness and his blessing can have a weight that can make you want to snap. So you're blessed, but you are. So examples of this would be when work is draining you, but you feel the tension of being grateful to have a job. Or if you're married and you have kids, it's when your kids are demanding or your family seems to be falling apart, but you feel the tension of being grateful for them. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Family feels a little too much. They're just exaggerated in all of their emotions. And you're stressed. <laughs> but at the same time, you're grateful to have family. Because you see others that may not have a family and you're like, oh, dang, I can see what they're going through. So you're blessed. Yeah. But you're stressed. Yeah. When you've experienced a great loss, but you feel the tension of being grateful for life. Or how about this one? When you've experienced heartbreak, when abuse has been present, when you're a victim of prejudice or discrimination, but in the midst of all these things, you feel the tension of knowing that someone else has it worse than you. This was the tension that these men must have felt the moment God said, I have brought you from slavery to freedom, but now I want you to cut a part of you off. You're blessed, but you're stressed. We're, 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 we're the same. We have moments where God wants to bless you and you are blessed. And one of my favorite things is when, <laughs> like I said, people from the outside are looking in and they're going, whoa, that girl's so lucky. Oh man, that guy is so lucky. But man, that luck, which we call a blessing, brings stress. So I want to encourage you that this year you crossed over and we've been blessed and you've been blessed. Yeah. But if you have been experiencing blessing with stressing, you're not alone. And it's part of the process. And it's just part of life. And we just need to have the right perspective in order to keep on pushing through and conquering the land that God has called us to conquer. Someone say, amen. So nowadays, you know, God is not really looking for circumcision physically. He's looking for circumcision in the heart. So it's a spiritual thing. And so I just want to kind of see that. I want us to see that in Colossians. Chapter 2, verse 11 says this, when you came to Christ, you were, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. So like the men of Israel, we too go through these moments where we experience blessing, but there's a tension that comes with the blessing through these little circumcision moments that we have in life. So I want us to look at three areas where we will see the tension between blessed and stressed. Three areas, and these are not all the areas, but these are just some of the areas. And I believe that these will relate to you, and I know that they definitely relate to me. These are the places of tension between blessed and stressed. Number one is your strength. Circumcision meant that you had to cut away your flesh. That's what it actually meant that you had to cut away your flesh. And there's a reason why. And the reason for this was so that God could remind Israel not to rely on the strength of their own flesh, but on God's strength. Now, this part of this message is it's, it's catered to all the achievers and specifically the overachievers. Those that like the grind and hustle, not the ones that like to say that they grind and hustle. I'm talking about the ones that actually do it. The ones that don't say it, but actually do it. If you say it too much, you probably don't do it. <laughs> but if you are a person that likes to grind and you like to hustle and you like to achieve and overachieve and you like to really make a name for yourself, this part is a part that's going to challenge you. 
Because God circumcised the entire nation of Israel in that second generation simply to remind them, cut your strength of your own flesh off. I don't want you to depend on your own strength. I don't want you to depend on your own intelligence. People that take pride in their genius or in their intelligence or in their wisdom, this part is mainly for you. Because that will rob you of experiencing God's best. And that will rob you of experiencing God's strength. Look what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 3, verses 3. It says this, For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. So watch this. Now there's this tension in our lives where we want to be blessed by God. But somewhere in the blessing we experience stress. You ask God to bless you and in his blessing you experience what it really means to be weak. And right there when God blesses you and you experience weakness, there's that tension. Dang. I'm blessed. But I'm weak. Dude, this was my story. You know, I grew up in church, grew up listening to preachings my whole life. My dad and my mom uh, both came from different backgrounds. My mom was a Catholic. My dad was a Mormon. I don't know how those two came together. <laughs> but they did, and then they turned out Christian, so praise God. I had family members that were Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, I remember debates all the time at home. And so I heard a lot about God. And then I was just, you know, absorbed with a lot of scripture and a lot of information uh, from a young age. And I came to church and um, grew up in church. Then in my teen years, I just left God. And then in 2007, December 2007, I come to Christ. And Christ changed. He changes my entire life. And uh, when I was a little kid, I used to be a little preacher. So I would like preached to my entire complex uh they knew me as a little pastor i was sending everybody to hell it's like you spoke you're going to hell <laughs> can you picture a little marlin and uh used to wear suits and ties to school i was legit like a junior little pastor a family friend thought i was a dwarf <laughs> because i just spoke so like intellectually at a little age and i was always wearing suits but all that fire died in my teen years until it got rekindled in 2007, December 2007, and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And the desire to become a pastor was uh, rekindled, and I became a pastor. Uh, no, I became a Christian, and the desire to become a pastor was there. And, and so I had a pastor that was very young, and I looked up to him a lot. And I just wanted to be a pastor, and I just wanted to build a church. And what you see here was always in me. And... Um, 2007, I give my life to Jesus in December. And then 2012, God gives me the go to start our church in 2012. So we're 10 years old. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm going to build the best church ever. I'm going to build the biggest church. I'm going to build the greatest church. I'm going to build um, the most popular church in Vancouver. I'm going to make a great title or great uh, uh, um, impact uh, in inner city with our church. I was just thinking about how big I was going to make it and how good I was going to make it. And then 10 years later, here I am going, wow. If God doesn't come, I'm not enough. And throughout the years, I started realizing and learning how weak I really am. At the beginning, I was strong. At the beginning, I was wise. At the beginning, I was creative. At the beginning, I was so anointed that I knew I was going to do it. I was going to, we're like, mega church in one year. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and so God gave me the blessing to start this church. And that is a blessing because I did not want to start a church without his approval. Never. I used to hear people tell me, start a church and we'll follow. Start a church, my whole entire family will follow. I was like, I'm not starting until God tells me to. Yeah. And so when God gave me the go, I started it, and that was a blessing in itself. But the blessing, oh my, did it bring stress. <laughs> Pastoring a church is one of the hardest things that you will ever, ever get to do in life. I remember when I was like, hey, we're going to build a mega church, and only like 15 to 20 people would show up. 
Having to preach to 15, 20 people to a person that wants to be a pastor is one of the hardest things for them to do and do it well. Mm. I remember those days. I was so discouraged. I would prepare. We would prepare. Nobody would show up. People that were supposed to show up only gave us false hope. <laughs> and it was such a difficult time for me. And raising up leaders and pouring into leaders and educating people and giving part of your life to them. And then all of a sudden, one day, they just walk away. And then I started learning, dang, this is way too big for me. Before I thought I was too big for it. But see, if, if, if there's only blessing and no stress, there's no humility. We need blessing and we also need the stress a little bit so that we can remain dependent on God in life. And I'm wondering how many people here are trying to start their thing or trying to do their thing and you're trying to do it on your strength. And it's not working out for you. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I got to grind and I got to keep hustling. And yes, have the grind. Respect the hustle. That's all good. But you know what you need to do above that? You need to learn how to switch your strength for God's strength. We want God to give us influence. We want God to give us platform. We want God to give us power. And all these things are good. And all these things that we want are amazing. But then comes the crushing there comes the crushing. You want influence? The crushing will come. You're going to have more people talking bad about you than you ever thought or even imagined. You want power? It's going to bring a lot of temptation to you that might have the power to corrupt you. There's that tension. And so God allows blessing, but he also allows stress. He allows prosperity and influence, but he also allows crushing. And there's that tension again. You're blessed, but simultaneously, you're feeling stressed. We desire the promised land, but circumcision is a part of the deal. And circumcision has a tension. And that tension is, you have to cut your own strength off in order to receive God's. So the tension between blessed and stressed, the first area that this touches is, is your strength. Here's the second one, and here's like the meaty one, your purity. We can all agree that one of the reasons for circumcision is hygiene. It's to stay clean. They still practice circumcision today, but they do it to babies. And the reason why they practice circumcision is because of cleanliness. So they want, you know, people to stay clean. And that's a good thing. This could represent purity in your life and my life. And the main angle that I'd like to tackle this is sexual purity. We all want the blessing of a healthy and prosperous relationship. Someone say amen. amen. But that, my friends, has a tension. The tension comes from the choice of remaining sexually pure. True. Sexual purity is a tension. Especially in 2022. If you're having sex before marriage, you're in sexual sin. If you're having sex with someone that is not your spouse, you're in sexual sin. And the stakes are higher for you. If you're single and you're sleeping around, you're in sexual sin. This might not be popular to preach, but I don't care. For real, even if none of you were shouting at me right now, I would not care. It doesn't matter what background you're from. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter if you love each other in your hearts. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's 2023 or 2045. God's word remains the same. Yeah. And God's word is saying that sexual sin is something that you do against God and you do against your own body. Yeah. Any of you flirting around with sexual sin, it's still sexual sin. Yeah. Sexual favors. And a lot of people sometimes, I know this because obviously we're a young church. Um, one of the biggest problems with young people is that they will not have sexual intercourse, but they will have sexual favors. And they still think that they're fine. No. Sexual sin is sexual sin. Sex is reserved for those that are married. Mm -hmm. And only between the two people that got married. <laughs> Not like you're going to invite somebody to be like, hey. 
And that's what we're watching on Netflix. Okay, I'm wondering how many parents would listen to me preach, like the older generation would listen to me preach right now and they would feel so uncomfortable in this moment. Because they live in oblivion sometimes, no offense, thinking that none of you actually hear about this, but it's all over Netflix. And it's normal. Little kids are hearing about this more than you think of or imagine. And so when the church is talking about it to keep them pure, like, oh, we don't talk about those things. Those things are embarrassing. They're not embarrassing. They're life and death, bro. Yeah, yeah it's eternity. Yeah. I like what the Proverbs um, author wrote, and he's giving his son advice, and he's speaking toward um, specifically the male gender, but I want us to read it and uh, apply it to both genders because we can flip and uh, we, can, we can flip the roles. But listen to the advice that he's giving through an observation that this father made. It is a very interesting one that I think that will help a lot of us in the church uh, kind of be a little bit more intentional about understanding people's motives sometimes. You ready? Yeah. Proverbs chapter 7, look what it says. Love wisdom like a sister. Make inside a beloved member of your family. Let them protect you from an affair with an immoral woman or an immoral man. From listening to the flattery of a promiscuous woman. So you got to protect yourself from that or a promiscuous man. While I was at the window of my house, looking through the curtain, I saw some naive young men. And one in particular who lacked. (laughs) I feel like this man at the curtain a lot of the times in our church. (laughs) Sometimes I see someone talking to someone they should not. And I'm like, they lack common Common sense, like Gucci says, is not common. (laughs) He was crossing the street near the house of an immoral woman, strolling down the path by her house. Hey, you can't go in proximity sometimes because proximity means that you might get in trouble. You know how we go, like, I can handle it. No, you can't. Shut up. (laughs) The woman approached him, seductively dressed and sly of heart. So she seduced him with her pretty speech and enticed him with her flattery. Be careful you talk to young ladies. Be careful you talk to young men. He followed her at once like an ox going to the slaughter. He was like a stag caught in a trap awaiting the arrow that would pierce his heart. He was like a bird flying into a little knowing it would cost him his life. That's a lot of analogy right there. I think he's trying to get a point across. For she had been the ruin of many. Mm. Many men have been her victims. And watch this. Her house is the road to the grave. Her bedroom is the den of death. Wow. The price to sexual immorality is expensive. It is expensive. And the price is never billed to you a few weeks or days or months after. The bill comes years later. Believe me. The bill comes years later. And it's a costly bill. And sometimes the bill means that you won't pay it, but your children will. Because sin is spiritual. Hmm? But the most expensive price to pay when it comes to sexual immorality, I'll tell you which one it is, not inheriting the kingdom of God. Look what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes, or practice homosexuality, or are thieves, or greedy people, or drunkards, or are abusive, or cheap people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Drop the mic, Paul. That's a pretty deep verse. That's it's heavy. That's not fun to preach. Especially after last after last weekend. We're crossing. Amen. <laughs> Now God's like, you're not going to make it to heaven. (laughs) 
that's that's the tension. That's the tension. I'm so blessed, but I'm stressed. That's the tension. You know, I have a lot of friends that were my age, and they died without Christ. I have one in particular that died last year, around this time. And it's been a year in eternity without Christ. I can't fathom, and I don't even want to imagine, the things that he must be living through, and the regrets he must be having. And I used to preach to him since I was a child, till last year, and he never chose to surrender to Christ. And he was, he came to a church, he was a part of it for, for a little while. What's the point of you being stressed out and angry at me for something that God decided? And these are the things that are actually going to point out where you will spend eternity. There's no point of you getting bothered or upset or even getting mad at God and calling him antiquated. Because you can call him antiquated all you want. You can call God's word irrelevant all you want. But on judgment day, I'm so sorry. That's what's going to judge you. There's no other standard. It's it's not going to be based off your morality and how much good you did and how much bad you did. It's based off what God said. You know what this is? This is like an open book test. If you fail it, anybody that fails an open book test, I'm sorry, I love you. But dang, the answers were right there. This is life, an open book test. And on judgment day, God's going to look at the book and he's going to look at your life. Uh Uh-huh. And so you can get bothered, but you know what? All the things that you're angry about when God confronts in your life, when you're in eternity, it's not going to matter. It's not. You're going to be in eternity and all your arguments are just going to be irrelevant. Because where you're going to be is going to shut everything down that you fought for, especially if what you fought was contradictory to God's word. Now, you don't have to believe me, and I'm not going to fight for you to to be convinced. I don't need to convince you. My responsibility as a pastor is to preach, Mm -hmm. not convince. I'm supposed to teach, not try to convert. I can't convert anybody. My only responsibility is to speak, preach, teach. Now let the Holy Spirit work in your heart. Yes. And then if you're willing to let the Holy Spirit work, then he'll transform you and help you and change you. And I'm not saying that it's going to be easy, but you do need him to transform you and change you. And if you don't let it happen like that, then I'm so sorry, then I can't do anything for you. The greatest price of sexual sin is not inheriting the kingdom of God. So really, Is your little session, is your little session in a car really worth it? Is the sleepover really worth it? Let me add another one. Is the traveling together really worth it? Because some people are still delusional. Like, we'll travel, we'll not sleep with each other. (laughs) And if you can do that, wow, my hat, I... Dang, you got some strong willpower. And these are convictions that I hold in my life. These are not like, you know, a specific time to hang out and traveling together or be in a car alone at a specific hour. These are convictions that I have for my life. I can't place those on you. But these are boundaries that I've chosen in my life that when I start dating, then I'm going to be as careful as possible. I want accountability. I want someone to be able to come into my relationship with whoever I'm with and be, hey, um, ask, I want them to ask all the tough questions. Hey, are you sleeping with her or not? Mm-hmm. Look at me in the eye. Are you touching? Are you allowing touch? Mm-hmm. I want people to ask me that because I want to finish well. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering how many of you in this room, instead of wanting that, you run from it and you get angry when you get it. My God. No one gets into my personal life. Okay. Sure. 
that's fine. But you are going to be accountable to God. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Sexual purity. We all want the blessing of a beautiful family. The price is to live in the tension of, will I remain sexually pure or not? Because sexual sin has a high price. And the worst one is not inheriting the kingdom of God. So there is that tension again. You may have the blessing of a relationship, but the stress of purity is a part of it if we want God's promises. Number three, and we're done with this, your pain. One of the most obvious part of what circumcision brought was the pain in private places. This is true for our lives today. When we're blessed and facing some sort of stress, we will experience pain in the private places of our life. On the outside, everything looks fine, but in the crevices of our private life, there is pain. So when the guys got circumcised in Israel, there was private pain. It was tough. They couldn't walk. And that's a representation for you and me. That when we're going through the blessings of life and we've crossed over, but then there's stress in our life, some of those pains that we face during the stressful moments that we go through, they're private. So you could be laying down on a pillow right beside your husband or your wife and crying while they're sleeping soundly. You could be in church saying, amen, pastor, preach it. But deep down in the crevices of your heart, you're mourning. You can look so good and you can look fly. Your hair could be really nice and your lipstick's on point. And you got like an amazing outfit. But internally, you're crushed. It's, it's going, it's, it's, it's blessing. You're in a season of blessing, but there's stress. And that stress, that circumcision moment allows us to have private places in pain. My encouragement to you is persevere through the pain. Because in Jesus' mighty name, you will be healed. God will restore and he will promote you in public as a reward for persevering in private. The private pain is where the tension is the strongest, at least in my experience. But healing does come and so does the reward.